Welcome to the Running For Real podcast, where each week we bring you a conversation designed to help you create positive change in your life, community and planet. It's a collective of conversations about running, the climate emergency and social justice. Running For Real is for the brave, for those with courage and vulnerability. United by our love of running, we're driving momentum towards some of the really tough challenges we're facing as humanity. So come join me, Tina Muir, and let's get started. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 272 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I am excited you are here. And today we have a bit of a unique episode, um, but it was too good of an opportunity for me to not take up. And I am very excited to be sharing this conversation with you. As you know, I'm very fiercely passionate about an, um, environmental action and doing what we can to, um, you know, make sure our fate is not sealed in terms of the uh, climate emergency, doing what we can and yeah, taking that environmental action. Um, It's really important to me and it's really important to my guest today. So today I am very excited to welcome Jerome Foster II to the Running For All podcast. Now, Jerome did actually run in high school and middle school, so he knows running well. However, right now he is most known, even though he is only 19 years old, as an American climate change activist, a voting rights advocate, and he's currently a Biden White House advisor. Uh, He's the youngest member serving on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council within the Biden administration. And he had previously served as a congressional intern for the U.S. Representative John Lewis. So he has an amazing story. He's a great guy, um, as I said, only 19. So got a lot to add and a lot of perspective that I don't often get to hear. um, And I suspect that's the case for many of you as well. So this is a real treat for for me, for you. And I really think this episode is going to leave you feeling optimistic about the situation that we are in right now and that we can figure this out, especially with people like Jerome, um, you know, being a big driving force. But that said, you will also get to hear that um, there are some some consequences that come with doing what he does, um, some things he's major things he is sacrificing. And this is also a, a vulnerable conversation. So let's get to it. Uh, we'll thank one of our sponsors and we'll be to this episode with Jerome Foster II. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. My friends, I have something to tell you. I need to get tested again. It always makes me stressed because I really don't like needles. They stress me out. Uh, even though I have had... I mean, countless needles over my lifetime. But even with Inside Tracker, I've had probably 10 plus assessments. Um, I've been tested over 10 times. It doesn't seem to get any easier, but yet I still do it. And it is still worth it, even with a needle phobia. Um, It is amazing to know what is going on on the inside. And Inside Tracker is going to be this comprehensive way of checking out what is going on on the inside. I mean, the name makes sense, right? It was founded by leading scientists in aging, genetics, and biometric data. It's this ultra personalized performance platform like no other. And they have an app now too, which is really awesome. I definitely recommend it. They use a patented algorithm to analyze your body's data, provide you with a clear picture of what's going on inside you. Then they offer you science-backed recommendations for positive diet and lifestyle changes. Then they're going to give you a concrete action plan and track your progress towards reaching your goals every day and every step of the way. So you get yourself tested, you tell them a little bit about yourself, they'll give you an analysis and recommendations, you'll select a goal and customize the recommendations that work for you and your lifestyle, and then you'll track your progress. Over time, as I have been doing, you get to see which ones you're getting closer and closer to optimize, which things need work, and which things are at risk, so you can retest uh, often to see what's working and what is not. They have this ultra personalized nutrition platform that's going to analyze from your blood, DNA, and fitness trackers to see what is going to help you to reach your goals. It is a really cool service, and friends, 
For a little bit longer, you get 25% off when you go to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina. You will get 25% off. Don't hold back. As we are going into these winter months, we want to make sure that we are in a good place with our body. We all know that the winter months can be the toughest time on our body. So let's go into it knowing where we are at. You can go to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina. Jerome, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running for a Podcast. I'm excited you are here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So Jerome and I were talking before we started recording and we've decided that we're going to skip everything we were going to talk about. And instead, Jerome is going to create a marathon training plan for us, uh, <laughs> even though he's got some stellar middle school cross country experience to give him foundation for that. So is that okay? You're going to spend this entire hour talking through your marathon training plan for us. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> when I said this to Jerome, he wasn't paying attention at first. I was feeling tired and he said, yeah, sounds good. And then was like, wait, what? No. <laughs> so um, we are not going to talk about that. We are, however, going to start by talking about the fact you are an American climate change activist, voting rights advocate, Biden White House advisor. You were a former congressional intern for US Representative John Lewis, executive director of One Million of Us. And as I said about uh, being in the Biden White House, you're the youngest member serving on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council within the Biden administration. When someone repeats that back to you at age 19, do you often take a minute to be like, whoa, that is a lot. Or do you, do you get yourself so wrapped up in what you're doing that you forget to step back and, and, and think that's actually a, a lot for a 19 year old? Well, I always try to be cognizant of the work that I do and try to take steps back and be like mindful. And I try to meditate whenever I can, but in the spur of the moment, it's just whatever I can do it. When I, before I had any of these titles, I just wanted to make an impact. So yes. whatever that meant, whether that was like voting rights or without journalism or activism, it was that that journey that just led me here. But I never beforehand was like, I want to be working in the White House by such and such age. I just yes. happened to work and really be passionate about the fact that we need climate action. And this pathway is what has led me here. So I think that's a really good point. And I'd love to dive into that a little bit more, because I think as someone who's also very, should we say, obsessed with um, making change, uh, uh, yeah, like you said, taking climate action. I think it's easy to think that people like you and I have, you know, we're three year old, three years old and lecturing people about like, make sure you're doing this and, um, you know, uh, have decided early on that this is the path we want to talk about. This is the thing. But um, many listeners might think of climate activists and think, oh, your parents must have chained themselves to a tree or um, you must have had some kind of massive thing that that led you down that path and gave you kind of a, a leg up to to take this step. But talk to the listeners about the fact that, um, as you said, talk more into what it has just grown naturally and occurred in a way where you just did what you felt was right and then things just would come in front of you. Yeah. Um, so it basically, I've always had a passion with nature and always wanted to just go out in my local creeks and forest. And like my family used to, have to take like long walks, but other than that, we weren't activists. We were just mm -hmm. everyday people understanding the fact that there's a looming climate crisis and that no elected official is really courageous enough to actually do anything about it. So it was us doing research, reading books, um, watching documentaries, educating ourselves as much as we could, and then became the best um, we could be. In any way that we could, we tried to like change our, change the small things. And we realized through us changing the small things that that wouldn't change anything. That us just doing small actions is not the solution. It's the system that has to change because the system is what caused the problem. Um, and through that realization, I just spent like hours and hours like every night. And I used to be a computer programmer and that was my first passion. And I used my activism in a means of virtual reality. And I used to just code like two, three, four in the morning. It was like just pouring my heart into like an experience so other people could understand the climate crisis in a new way. Mm -hmm. And every time I was talking to people about the climate crisis, no one understood it. And that was yeah. the big issue is that like, I really what has been pushing me for so long is that like 
people on a wide scale don't understand the scale, scope, and speed of the climate crisis. And I'm trying to understand the, the correct medium to reach people. But once yes. I started reaching people and started organizing my community, I realized it's not the people that don't understand, it's elected officials. Everyday people know the climate crisis is here. They know what's happening. Some people might not know what's happening. They, they may just be like oblivious to it, but they don't have to be aware of it. What Who has to be aware of it is the politicians that have a responsibility to represent the people. And that's who has to change. So yeah, it's, it's, just, it's been a long journey of, of that realization and trying to figure out the correct medium to spread, spread the message. So let's talk to that then, as we have a medium right here and a lot of people listening. You said there it's not about individual action. And I have tried to hammer this point home that, yes, well, you know, if you have the choice between purchasing some takeout in a compostable box or a plastic box, yeah, choose the compostable box. But it's not about that. Like, talk about, uh, I would just love for you to go into a little bit about what is going to be happening over the next five, 10 years in terms of we're going to be told it is our individual impact. We're going to be told that we're not trying hard enough, that we need to think about different ways of of living our lives, that we need to um, change everything. When, as you said, it's the system. Um, but when people hear it's the system, they think, okay, well, I vote every four years or two years, uh, if you include the midterms, what else do I do? Um, a just lot of give what a happens bit of a picture. is beyond voting. I think that when you think about a system, it's not just like, oh, it's a major system we can't control. It's very much grassroots and very much open to how we can make change. There's the fossil mm-hmm. industry, which pays elected officials to not take action. And that's why we don't have climate action. It's just that. That's the system is money and politics. Mm-hmm. And it's like, mm-hmm. that's what people have to understand is that like beyond voting, we have to also be actively aware and actively pushing our elected officials if we don't elect people that are real champions of the people. A lot of times when we vote, we have to look beyond their just message. We have to dig into what they're actually standing for. And we have to like people that are from our communities that understand what we're going through because they're elected representatives. So they're elected to represent the issues that we care about. But oftentimes what we're seeing now is that elect- the people that are in power, like our Congress members and our senators that are supposed to be in our communities having conversations with us, aren't. They're sitting in Congress, taking money and just sitting in their chairs. And that's all they're doing. And that's, they're not doing their job. So I think that's really what has to change is our understanding of what a a elected representative is. Also, I think that when we talk about personal changes and personal accountability, I think that it's a luxury for people to say, like, you may have a choice between plastic and compostable materials Mm -hmm. because that primarily only happens in wealthy communities that are predominantly white. And most of the world does not have access to that. Even looking into America and in Europe, most people don't have access in just middle income um, neighborhoods. So if we think about the wider spectrum of the world, it's very, very, very few people that have the option to change their lifestyle in a meaningful way to, to, to limit things. They can, yeah, they can limit um, the amount of beef they use. They can limit their food choices and that might make a big impact, but shifting almost completely away from plastic is something almost unattainable for most people. Mm-hmm. What has to happen mm-hmm. is that, for us to not have to constantly change how we live our lives, but for them, for the companies that that make these materials to change, to revert back to what they used to do. Like a Coca Cola used to make glass bottles, and they yep. used to return them after you drink them. But then that changed. Why did that change? No one asked them to change, and now they're saying, since we made that change, you now have to change your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And it's like we never asked for you to change in the first place. So you must go back to a sustainable lifestyle. We must go back to that ideology of, of that understanding of that if a company if a company makes a product they have to be accountable to that product that they make and what happens to it and that's i think is the biggest thing that people have to understand yeah great thank you those are many great points there and um and you know everyone listening has some connection to something that can make a difference here whether you work for a coca-cola or you know we can talk about um university system like you were um you held climate uh, strikes on the steps of uh, uh, the library at, at Harvard University um, and called on them to divest their endowments in the fossil fuel industry. So maybe someone le- works for a university and that's your access point of where you can make change. I would love for you to talk into the fact that do you think everyone listening has some, uh, it can be overwhelming if you say, I'm going to 
speak up on every single point related to climate change, because at the end of the day, everything is related. But do you think that everyone has some passion area within climate change that they can focus on and hone in on um, and really start to make change within their community? Or do you think it is better to just kind of blanket, try and do as many things as you can? Oh, it's so crucial that like, don't try to spread yourself too thin. Just, I think you start from your passion and Mm -hmm. that's where most activists in the youth climate movement or the climate movement in general started is just, they were passionate. I was passionate about coding. I know a friend of mine was also passionate about art or passionate about like finance or just media, telling a story, telling a narrative, like whatever you're passionate about outside of like your everyday work, use activism as a way to explore that. Like it's Mm -hmm. so beautiful to actually see someone who's like passionate about say photography and goes out and provides photos for a march because then that spreads across social media and even more people are able to access what we do. Like without that photographer who took the time to do that, we wouldn't have that, that amplification possibility. So everything that you do, everything that you're passionate about can help our movement and help by you just contributing like an hour or two a week just by connecting with a local organization like Zero Hour, Sunrise Movement, One Million of Us, or the plethora of other organizations out there. Just Mm -hmm. just send them an email, send them a a text across social media and get involved. Yes, I love that. Thank you. Um, I was just uh, reading an article this morning that came out as we're recording this that said um, today's six-year-olds will live through, this is from the Washington Post, Uh, A study found that today's six-year-olds will live through about three times as many climate disasters as their grandparents if current warming trends continue. So the study found this. um, As many people listening are either parents or have uh, young people in their life, uh, I mean, you are obviously coming into that adulthood um, point of view, but um, I think many listeners have kids or have kids around them. Uh, would you like to send a message as someone who's just come out of that um, teenage childhood stage of just a message you would like to pass along to them that uh, it isn't too late. We don't have to um, just give up and say, well, things are happening. There's nothing we can do. Um, Yeah. yeah, From your youth perspective. I think, um, and for context, I just turned 19 this year, looking back on like my teenage years, And also my childhood, I think that, and this definitely comes into perspective when I was talking to a parent a few weeks ago where she was telling me, just asking me, how can I tell my child about climate change and how can I make them aware of it? And I was like, conflicted because really you shouldn't, you shouldn't tell them about the scale of the climate crisis. What you should really do is tell them about how to live sustainably, because if you just tell them about the climate crisis, like so many adults have been doing for, for my generation, it changes your entire perspective about the world. Mm-hmm. And it makes you feel this sense of anxiety that the entire system that you're growing up to study in is being destabilized by like people not taking climate action. Then mm-hmm. it disincentivizes so many things. And it makes you feel anxiety about just everyday life because in 10 years, my neighbor is going to continue flooding. In 10 years, my entire neighborhood might be burned down because I live on, and I might live in California. Me living in New York City, we might see this entire island underwater. And we're already seeing that in Miami-Dade County. And that's incredibly just anxiety-inducing. So I think if you just tell a young kid, like, hey, this is the norm. Like, the norm is having a solar panel house and having an electric car and teaching them, teaching them through example, then that is how you can raise a generation that sees gas powered cars and coal, oil, and natural gas as how my generation sees the rotary phone and sees like the VHS, (laughs) Mm -hmm. like it's outdated. And like, if we just, just transition that way through example to to young people, then we can make the best impact. But just by scaring them and telling them what's going on, that does much more harm than good. Yeah. I've actually been working through this myself. I have a three-year-old and she'll see things like right now there's those of Halloween decorations and, and blow ups and things around. And she'll say, well, why don't we have those? And I'm like, well, because we want to be respectful to mother earth and we want to, we're going to put natural things out there that can regrow and become something else. So we'll put some pumpkins out there. And she's like, you know, what do you mean by some things aren't part of mother earth? And so trying to explain to her to respect our planet, but not be like 
that's bad. This is good because then what am I teaching her that she's then going to, you know, um, conflict with friends and, and just find herself in difficult situations, but it is tough for parents. And I, I thank you for bringing that up. Cause I think that is something that, um, is easy to do once you get to the point where it does matter to you a lot. And yeah. with that, you said about growing up, you know, um, I've, I've read from you that you have talked about um, yourself and other climate activists who have dedicated themselves to climate change, look forward to going back to what you love to do. So maybe you said about coding or other things, having some kind of career. And that isn't often talked about the fact that um, this isn't what you, like you said, you were a child saying like, I want to grow up and speak about, you know, taking climate action. So let's talk about what has it been like knowing, what is it like um, for you knowing that someday you hope you kind of work yourself out of a job? Um, just talk to that maybe for a minute. Yeah, I think that it, it's always just really weird because it's like people try to think, make it seem like we in, like made a choice to skip school and do this, but it was out of the anxiety if we didn't do it. And for, for me, I, I was always passionate about quantum physics and coding. And like, if I wasn't forced to fight for my future, then I would be studying like dark matter and quarks and like how like the, the universe works since I, I I'm really interested in that. And if I did have the option to do that, I would be doing that right now. But right now I have to spend basically every single day organizing, meeting with other young people, talking with elected officials on how they can do their job better. When I'm in college, a full-time student and also trying to get into the workforce and also trying to have a social life. And also tasked with basically raising raising this entire like our movements coming together and raising the, the alarm, saying that this is the time for action. And I think that that's really taken a lot of our childhood away because we have to grow up so fast and basically be the adults in the room because all the adults were too childish to understand that you're fi we're fighting for the basic necessities. And they were so mm -hmm. childish to think that oh well we can keep doing what we're supposed to, we're, we can keep doing this non-action and no one will care, but they're not realizing the entire generation is coming behind them and they didn't give any regard to that at all. And now that we're yeah. facing them and having meetings with them so often, like now they're realizing it's like, oh, we didn't have that empathy. We didn't have that compassion. And it's like, yeah, it took us having to organize 7.5 million young people all across the world every single Friday, striking from school for you to even understand that there is a crisis that exists. So that is, is incredibly draining and also just sure. a testament to the fact that we don't have the pe proper people in office. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And I have thought often about how, um, yeah, it is portrayed as like, oh, there's another child, uh, wanting to skip school. So they just find a reason to go you know, not to go, but it is very much not the case. It, as you said, it is a lot of energy and everyone knows to try and organize something. I mean, even if it's just been a birthday party, like there's a lot that goes into organizing people and getting things set up. And, um, and so to be doing that during, you know, these pivotal years of your life, I mean, it's, it's so much. And, and you said that, doing it like every Friday, yeah. like every <laughs> Friday you're organizing, having good petitions, having good signatures, having to meet with elected officials, and then for them to say, oh, that's cute. You guys yeah, yeah. are being trendy. And it's like, this is not a trend. This is like mm -hmm. us spending hours after school. Like I used to go to the janitor's closet to organize in my school because I couldn't do it in the classroom. And the, mm -hmm. I'm not the only example. Some people went to the back of the cafeteria room hiding under a table to organize strikes every Friday. Yeah. In like ninth, 10th grade. That's <laughs> insane. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. And you mentioned there about feeling some sadness for what, you know, for having to grow up some so fast for, um, just your childhood. Um, you know, talk to that about, um, having, yeah, having missed out on things, having those years of your life where maybe not carefree, but those final years of your life where you can, you're growing, you're figuring out who you are, but you also get to have fun and you're, like you said, essentially working, um, from 10th grade. So talk to us about yeah, how that has felt. Yeah, it just feels like your future was stolen, quite mm -hmm. honestly. It, mm -hmm. Sometimes you feel angry about it. Other times you just feel like this is the reality of the situation. But I think that beyond what we feel, I think if, you, if you're an adult listening to this, 
like contribute time because as young people, it's like, this isn't our responsibility. We were born into this mm-hmm. crisis and we were born into something we didn't even create. And we're being passed the baton saying, now you fix it. That's just also feels disrespectful too. Cause it's like, you basically walk into a house, destroy it, then hand the keys to someone else and say, now you clean it up. Yes. And it's like, yes. I didn't do any of this. I didn't reap any of the benefits that you did when you had fun making this mess. Now I have to spend all of my waking hours fixing what you did. And you don't even have the, the risk care, the care respect to come back and help me clean it up. I think that's what we're asking people to do is is to help whatever you can do. We don't need apologies. We don't need anything else. We know that you may not have known back in the day when it was happening that you're making a mess, but now, you know, so come and help and come be a part of this movement. That's what we ask. Thank you to Beam for sponsoring this episode of the Running for a Podcast and supporting many of the Together Runs, which I am loving hearing that you are enjoying. I want to talk today about the Elevate Variety Pack, which I have mentioned uh, in the past, and I am testing out some of their other products. But in the meantime, this is what I am loving. So much so that my husband, Steve, and I walk in the door after our run. We walk straight past each other and sometimes the kids... (laughs) Go straight to the kitchen, grab a shaker, uh, get some cold water in there and put one of these Beam Elevate packs into water and down it quickly because it tastes delicious. It is great for post-run, has those electrolytes and some other benefits. There is no added sugar. There is, these hydration powders do not contain hemp. I just want to mention that. So there's no concern if you are avoiding CBD. And the variety pack brings you a mix of Elevate Balance, which is hydration and probiotic. Uh, performance, which is hydration and energy blend and recovery, which is hydration and collagen. So whatever you want to be using or getting out of it, you can go do it like that. So with that variety pack, you have this chance to experience all the benefits of their three unique electrolyte powders. Balance has that potent blend of prebiotics, probiotics to support healthy digestion and immune function. The green energy coffee bean extract delivers an energizing boost while compounds like beetroot and vitamin B help your body convert dietary energy into physical energy. And last but not least, the recovery restores collagen while branch chain amino acids support tired muscles and help your body fight fatigue. They are really thoughtful with their ingredients. They are not just a hydration solution, but they're elevated supplements to help support hydration for each moment of your day. That's why their ingredients are sourced responsibly and you'll never find added sugars, GMOs or artificial sweeteners. So you can go to beamtlc.com and use code TINA. That's B-E-A-M-T-L-C.com and use code TINA to get yourself 15% off your order or 20% off if you want to sign up for a subscription. So go to beamtlc.com and use code TINA at checkout. Yeah, thank you for that. I remember um, a few years ago, two or three years ago, I came across a book that um, had been given to us for my kids uh and it was my husband's and it was talking about you know the climate crisis and how we how um how things needed to change and how we needed to respect the world and and um do all these things to it was about earth day and i looked at the date and it said like 1985 and i i remember being like what like how what happened in the, while i was growing up like no one <laughs> nothing changed and um and so i think that's really important that you yeah and that's what i really admire and respect about you is you are calling people out you are telling listeners like yeah come back and help and let's talk to unity here um you have said a lot about needing a truly diverse and multi-generational movement um, that has people from everywhere all backgrounds all ages it's not just about youth Tell us more into that. Yeah, absolutely. It, some of the biggest like collaborations we've had is intergenerational. Like mm-hmm. as climate week just happened last week, we saw that like a lot of elders and a lot of older adults came and organized events with youth. And that was like the wisdom of older generations, the energy of youth come together and make some, sometimes the most powerful events because they understand what happened before 1978, when ExxonMobil started doing disinformation campaigns all across America. And we understand not even seeing those ads because they stopped them in like the early 2010s. It's like, 
we have that perspective of both before and after and during. So we're able to understand the full context of the, the deadly actions the fossil fuel industry has taken against Americans and all of humanity. And I think that unity of having the older generations, young people, people of color, people that are not of color, just all coming together and sitting at the table and reconciling with the past allows us to adequately prepare for the future. Because if we don't sit at the same table and don't have these conversations, then we can never acknowledge what is happening to us. And we can then never prepare to the best extent for what's going to happen in the future because we don't know what's happening right now. If you don't talk to people and ask them what's happening in, in South America and Africa and Southeast Asia and in China, then you may only understand the context of Europe. And that is an incredibly small percent of the population. So if you don't have conversations that are global, globally aware, then oftentimes you find solutions that only pertain to that small case example. So That said, and I 100% agree with you, but a lot of people, especially here in the US or in the UK, might it's very easy to detach yourself from, from what's going on in other countries. You know, the, the whole thing of like, if you see one person injured or hurt, you rush to them. But when it becomes a thousand, like it's just a, a group of people, like it's hard to emotionally connect. What is it for, for, for most people listening here in the US, in Canada, in Australia, in um, the UK, is it better for them to focus on changes within their community that can then build that grassroots? Or are you just saying in terms of conversation, just to like be a global citizen and pay attention to what is going on, but yeah, make the specific changes where you are and then hope. No, and then what I'm saying is up. that, um, cause I think conversations are great, but there's a, there's an end to that conversation and then no action mm -hmm. happens. I think that the most powerful thing you can do, especially being in like the UK or the U S or Canada or, um, elsewhere, the, the biggest change you can make is by raising the awareness that the global South is being impacted first and worse. And yeah. I think that the first thing that we have to advocate for is for the filling of the green climate fund, like countries basically committed that they would pay climate reparations to those, that, those countries that are being impacted right now, mm -hmm. because of the fact that they're reaching tipping points years earlier than the global north because we've taken so much from these countries that now they can't even develop properly and mm -hmm. now that we're looking at them and saying why aren't you developed properly why are, why are these communities so not advanced and it's like we have to take into context that for 500 years they were enslaved and they were brutally and violently terrorized so they're scared to even be able to do anything and now they're when we think about the economic system bringing that into play as well like that holds them back even further. So I think that if you look at the global picture of like, what can I do as like a person who lives in like a rich country, the biggest thing you can do is one, raise awareness of the fact that we need to fill up the green, green climate fund um, that was committed by countries. And second, to basically reach out to people that are, that are across social media that are in these countries and raise awareness of them. I think that mm -hmm. one of the things that people always discounted about young people is that we're always on social media, but people didn't mm -hmm. realize that us being on social media mimic nature, that nature is globally connected and globally interconnected with each other and always works oh, in collaboration. And social media is kind of the same way. We're inherently connected to every single person on the planet. So we could uh -huh. connect with that person from Uganda, from Sierra Leone, from South Africa and say, Hey, what's going on here? Let's learn from you and you can learn from us. And from a very young age, you understood the intersectionality of race, of gender, of sex and so many different things that impact people that now our movement is even stronger because we have that unity and that interconnectivity. Yeah. Wow. I have not thought of it that way. That is really cool. And thank you for bringing that up. So there you just said about, um, you know, the intersectionality piece, um, climate justice is racial justice and there's, you know, a lot of, um, ignoring that is going on from uh, people in the global north as you've mentioned but also within the global north um there is a lot of uh the it's primarily black and brown um people who are impacted by climate change even in these northern countries let alone the southern countries so talk about how these things are connected and it's not we figure out climate change and then we go back and figure out um, racial justice. Talk about how these two pieces do come together and uh, intersect. Yeah. So the biggest thing that I ask for people that are listening now is to 
to fully understand what the climate crisis is, you have to think about the mindset of the people that were committing these atrocities of basically damaging our planet. For them to feel like they were allowed to do this, they had to have a, a, a thought process that extraction is okay and that limitless extraction is okay as long as it benefits some people. And that ideology starts with exploiting people, exploiting nature, exploiting the planet, and now just exploiting everything that they get their hands on. And if we look at it from that lens, then Industrial Revolution was just another example of that ideology of extraction and limitless pollution. Because even before then, we were seeing that they were extracting people. They were extracting communities and destroying them carelessly. And that same ideology carried through to the Industrial Revolution. Because now, as it's another moral problem, just like slavery was, now the Industrial Revolution is showing that that thought process carried throughout our entire economic system. And our economic system is based on a, a system of no morals, and whatever is exploitable is fair use. And that has to change fundamentally. That's what the climate movement is fighting for. It's intersectional with race because 80% of coal-fired power plants placed in the United States are in black and brown communities. Something that happens over and over again is not an accident. It's a part of how our, our, our economics functions. And if we look at who's being impacted first and worst, it's the same communities that were exploited so many years ago and for around 400 years that now their topsoil can't fight against rising sea level because of that erosion. Because of the fact they were forced to place the same plant over and over again, their soil can't absorb the nutrients and be able to fight climate change. And that is what we're fighting for, is that compound effect of, of social injustices. And climate change is acting like just a fire that's spreading and lighting every single issue on fire. When we think about sexism and how, how that's in, intersecting as well, a lot of communities that are being impacted right now are women-led, because indigenous communities are led by women. And oftentimes, they're the ones that are going out and providing food and providing shelter for communities. And when the water recedes, when the water continues to um, dry up in their communities, then women have to walk farther and farther. And that makes them even more vulnerable to sexual attacks, to so much violence against them. And that's why we say it's like climate justice is the biggest problem of our lifetime, but it's the best possibility and opportunity for us to create meaningful and systemic changes that brings compassion to, to every social issue that we've been fighting for for so long. Yes, thank you so much for explaining that so well. Now, you said there that, um, you know, it was uh, the extraction was to benefit a few. And I just want to highlight, and you can, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, in the coming years, a lot of the narrative that's going to be coming through is, well, the demand is there. The people need to stop requesting it, demanding it. If the demand for these materials is being asked for, we have to fulfill it. Um, whereas, we need to together hold these companies accountable and keep continue speaking about this, not to be greenwashed about this so that we can, um, so that we can say, yes, demand may be there, but give us other options, give us other ways of, um, not relying on fossil fuels because, um, the demand is only there because we don't, people either aren't aware or don't have a choice or, um, are, kind of stuck in a system. So talk to that piece in terms of some of the rebuttals that are going to come over the coming years as we try and do this massive task of um, changing the system. Mm, okay. Shifting to business side, it's very easy to understand what business has to do. It's only two things. It's one, they have to set out a clear plan within the next 10 to 15 years that they have to transition away from fossil fuels and fossil fuels can't even be an option. It's like you can you can't they don't even need to give a choice of use fossil fuels or solar. It's like renewables is the de facto, it's the default, and it's the only choice you can use. That's what we're demanding companies to do. Second is we're demanding that companies that create products that then go into the public have to be accountable to every garment or every bottle or every plastic or any material that they use. They're still accountable for that because their branding it came from their factory. And they made that choice to use that material and that they, they deserve to meet the consequences of whatever they do. So the second ask that we're make, asking for companies is that whatever output they make goes into another input. So in the case of, of apples per se, they use a robot where you can trade in your iPhones and they recycle all of those materials 
So now whenever they have a new iPhone and they have like new ones, they can use parts from older iPhones to construct newer ones. That's what we're asking for countries to be companies to be a hundred percent on the operation. So that every output comes from another input um, and making sure that every industry does that. So it's really easy on that. end. it's just companies just don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. So what can we do as individual consumers to, to hold companies accountable to that? Yeah. Um, I think that, um, the biggest thing that we can do is what use our economic buying power. Um, it doesn't really matter if a company makes one product that's sustainable because you buying that in spending $10 on that one sustainable product goes to a larger company that continues to pollute. And that profit goes to fuel the production of so many other um, materials that continue to destroy our planet. So what we ask of everyday consumers is to choose companies that only create renewables and tell that larger company, say um, Coca-Cola, that until all of your products are sustainable, then it doesn't matter that one of your bottles are sustainable because that one bottle is fueling the whole system. So that's what we're asking is that company just put their money where their mouth is and actually no, don't create token things that we can say, Oh, this helps the planet, but everything else still hurts it. But this one option <laughs> is good. Make every option yeah. good. So we don't have to make that hard choice of, do I want Fanta or do I want this? We don't, we're just living our lives. We want every product to be helping the planet, not to have to make choices. Every time we go to CVS asking ourselves, is this plastic? Is this biodegradable? We should not do that. <laughs> Thank you to Tracksmith for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast, Boston Marathon, my first race I'm doing of the year, or well not of the year, of this season, I should say, is uh, is just 10 days away. And I am very excited to go uh, be a guide and just get to be out there and on the race course. It's going to be really fun to do. And I will be wearing Tracksmith from head to toe because I am a huge fan in case that wasn't already obvious. And I am loving the fact that their full clothes are now out. Uh, the styles are beautiful as are the colors. And friends, I have told you, and this is the final time I'm going to be telling you, your, the $15 off $75 off coupon is going to be disappearing very soon. We are going to switch it to a giving code very soon. So you are going to be able to only get it for another few more days so make sure you go to tracksmith.com and use code tina15 to get $15 off your order $75 or more they have lots of new colors in all the old favorite styles i love the harrier long sleeve the brighton base tank i've told you about many times it is so cool that we're getting into full season where we can go out and wear those long sleeves but also there are quite a few different t-shirts and tanks for those uh if you are running later in the day or if you are racing I will be racing Boston in the Boston singlet that they have out now along with some of their shorts and their socks and everything. I will be in Tracksmith from head to toe. So be sure you can go check out all the different things that they have going on, but be quick because they tend to sell out. Tracksmith is very popular and you will see why they have wonderful quality, wonderful products and just check out the website in general. It is a great place to explore. There's a journal, a logbook, there's films, there's stories, there's events. There's just all kinds of fun things going on there and you will learn from just being on the website. So go to tracksmith.com and use code TINA15 to get yourself $15 off your order of $75 or more. Don't wait. This is one of the last few days you'll be able to use this code. So thank you again to Tracksmith for sponsoring this episode. So then this is something that, I mean, I put in the extra time to, to do a lot of research to find, to, to look for those options. But for many people listening, it is incredibly overwhelming. Like you take, you want to paint yeah. a room in your house and you're like, okay, I want to paint. If I type in sustainable paint, what's going to come up is the company, the big company that has an mm -hmm. eco line. So just give a few things that you have learned about what to watch out for or what to look for um, in terms of that buying power piece. Yeah, I think I, I know where you, that feeling of like trying to do anything and realizing that almost every option is just a big company giving that one product that's sustainable. I think that you have if to be aware of like sustainable. words. <laughs> Basically, it <laughs> might not be. And that's the thing, just don't pay attention to the word natural because it has no 
real meaning. Like they just use that as a marketing tool to make it seem like you're doing something good, but natural has no meaning. Um, what you should look for in food is that it's USDA organic. Any other form of organic can just be a marketing. You know, has to have the has to have the logo and the icon USDA organic. Second, I'd say for materials, um, make sure it's sustainably produced and sustainably made. But oftentimes, you just have to look at the back bar label. And I know that's not a good answer because, like, mm. the issue is like it's it's so hard right now. Even but for me, just trying to way, do it, right? Yeah, they've, they've it is <laughs> it's intentionally that way. Like, it, I mean, and that's the yeah. hard thing here is we don't. And it's like we should not have to do that. Just make make sure your options are all good, so we don't have to spend two hours trying to find a good piece of paint, good good paint roll. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So well, actually, yeah. I say that because I actually had that yesterday. So we. Uh, had a, uh, it's a long story, but anyway, some of our ceiling crumbled down fixing something and so we had to redo it um, and we we're going to get paint um, because it doesn't, of course, match. So I went to the paint store yesterday, having done half an hour of research as to the, the company to use. And I went there and the guy said, yeah, this company is fantastic for the environment. And I was like, well, that's not true. And then he mm. was like, well, this one, this one, they really care about the environment. And I was thinking, <laughs> well, no, they don't. Like I've mm. looked at their website. It's got all the right words, but they're saying things like we're going to reduce submissions like 30% by 2030. And I'm like, what? not really good enough. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but the guy, I mean, he was going off what he'd been told, which was what the big companies had told him. So, and that's what I was trying to say earlier with the, um, the demand piece is that the companies are going to keep saying, well, we're getting the the demand for these products. So we have to keep com- keep pumping them out. And so we don't, you know, why do we have to change? But if we as consumers keep asking, keep being that little annoying in their ear of like, hey, um, mm. when are you shifting to this? Uh, or like, what are your plans for that? Um, it's a lot of extra work and, and little things. But as we talked about earlier, picking a few things that are meaningful to you um, and really hammering home those companies or the the way the uh, areas of your life that are reasonable, um, it can make a difference. So, yeah, um, yeah. Anything else to add on that before we move on? No, I think that it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay. So you helped to organize three of the top ten largest climate marches marches across the Washington D.C. areas. And someone at this point is is kind of obvious that you just work hard, you're passionate, it, it's meaningful to you. But someone thinks, you know, there's no way I could do something that could be a, a top 10 climate march or um, he must have had some kind of pushes along the way. I mean, maybe they've read that you, that Greta Thunberg joined you for, um, yeah, I think it was like week 50 or something of her um, strike. Um, So maybe it came from her. Like, what would you like to say to people who might hear what you have done or hear what I talk about and they think, well, I could never do something like that? I would say that when I began for the first month, it was just by myself. I think, and I was nervous when I was going out to the White House. I was like, Trump is literally like feet away from me. (laughs) He's yeah. in the White House, right in front of the Oval Office. He could be looking out and saying, go arrest that kid. Like, there's always that fear of when you're about to do something right that you just have to get over. I think that's what took me so long as well. Like, I always tried to do coding because that was like, I wasn't going out behind in the field the doing something. Because yeah. I'm behind the scenes. But I think mm. it takes it takes a lot to push yourself to do that. And I know that feeling so, so much. Like, even when we did this climate strike on September 24th, last Friday, I was still nervous. I was like, well, what if we don't make an impact? What if this is just like something that we're doing and no one even pays attention to it and all the politicians start laughing at us that we're even still doing this? And it was the exact opposite. I think that we get into our head too much about what we can do. And when you realize, when you put yourself out there, you, what you're really doing is allowing the rest of the world to feel the same thing you're feeling. Because quite often, everyone's feeling the same thing you are. We think we're like so unique, but all of our, a lot of our feelings are the same and so uni- unified with other people's emotions. And I think that's what really exemplified in the climate strike movement is that it started with Greta and she was really nervous when she started as well because she was skipping school every day and every Friday she was going out there 
And she didn't realize that there was an entire generation that was feeling the exact same emotions as her. And she didn't realize there were millions of young people that would join her if she did. Mm -hmm. And you never know if you're watching this right now and thinking, how could I ever do that? Know that Greta was feeling the same exact thing. You could be that next person that mobilizes the next 7 million young people or the next 7 million people in your organization or just 10 people at your job. Like you have the power to do that because you have so much ability just by setting an example to create waves all around you. So just be confident in that and use that fear as a motivator to know that you're doing the right thing. Oh, I love that so much. And I will say that when you, before you take action, that anxiety, that fear, that despair, that anger, the all these like set sick, what is it? How many stages of how many stages, yeah, stages of, of grief? Uh, grief. That's it. Yeah. Like they're all in there in you. But then once you start doing things and you start speaking out, I feel like every time you do that, a little bit of that gets lifted because you're doing something. You're not just like, stop, stop stressing me out. Just go away. Like go away thought. Like instead yeah. you're like doing something and it feels empowering and it feels like, um, absolutely. It's like, it takes it I away. Give an example. I can give a clear example of what I know everyone's feeling like if you aren't in the movement and just like living your life, you just feel like a sense of like heaviness that you aren't a mm. part of it, but you want to get to be a part of it mm -hmm. so badly. And it's like, why can't I be a part of this? I really want to help. And it's like, you're always grieving and constantly feeling like you don't know how to. And just do the most obvious thing that you may be overlooking. Like how I got involved was by DMing my zero hour, my local zero hour on Instagram and saying, Hey, can I join you guys? And I had no faith <laughs> in that I, anyone respond to me. I <laughs> thought they would all ignore me and that they wouldn't even like care. But a day later they responded. And ever since then we organized and it's just that first step you have to take. Like, you never, that grief never leaves you mm -hmm. until you take that first step of hope because hope doesn't yeah. come from just having that feeling and it comes to you. It comes from the collective action of community. But if you don't tap into that community, all you're going to feel is grief. That feeling of yes. heaviness is never going to go away until you join this movement, get involved and feel that hope of, of being a part of the, 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 all the, the great action that's happening. I love that. Okay. Before you, uh, I want to talk about hope in a second. Didn't Greta DM you? Uh, I thought I, I read somewhere that you said about you DMing, but um, didn't uh, wasn't she the one that reached yeah. out to you three DMs as well? So like that shows that you know. <laughs> yeah, so I've been well. organizing before the climate strikes. I have been uh, involved uh -huh. about like I think two or three years beforehand, and I was working on the email team of Zero Hour, and Greta had sent an email saying that she was starting her climate strikes, and yeah. I was a person who saw that email and basically was telling everyone in the U S about it. So that was, it was great to, to see that. And at the time we didn't know it was going to be as big. We were just thinking, yeah, okay. She's climate striking. We'll see what happens. And then two weeks later, <laughs> yeah. we, we, history was made. So it, yeah. yeah it, it, and that was just her. Like before the climate strikes, she was just Greta Thunberg, just a regular mm -hmm. kid. And like, that could be, that could have been anyone. Like, yeah. I think that's the most powerful thing is that like, Everyone thinks they're too small to make a difference. But then as soon as we make a difference, everyone's like, how did you get there? And it's like, yes. I just did what I, whatever I thought I could. Uh-huh. Yeah. And weren't you the one who got um, the movement going to nominate her, uh, Greta, as the Time um, Magazine Person of the Year? That's really cool. Yes. We started a petition. It, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Was, was it surreal meeting her with like the presence that she brings of just, I mean, I'm sure she's surrounded constantly by media. Yeah, it's like, I'm not really a person who gets like starstruck that much because it's like they're mm -hmm. just people, but she was mm -hmm. just so sweet and just so genuine and mm -hmm. just so, just a ball of just energy that is just fighting for everything, right? That was just like, yeah. it just felt so good meeting her. Like it was just reconnecting over so many Zooms because people don't realize that <laughs> before the pandemic, like our entire movement was just Zoom because we're all at school. We couldn't do calls oh. after school because we were doing homework. So we all only saw each other on Zoom. As soon as the pandemic hit and everyone started using Zoom, I was like, now they're using our thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't get like, Zoom fatigue because you'd already uh, been practicing. Oh, no. We've been using that for like three years beforehand. <laughs> so it just felt like That's a continuation. <laughs> that is really funny. So then we talked. About, you talked about hope a minute ago there. Um, 
Do you, I, I know the answer to this, but do you have hope? Um, I have hope when I'm organizing with my fellow activists. Hope doesn't, the reason I don't really feel hope and the way people think I should is that hope is, is literally just the energy that you feel when you're, when you're making progress. But the problem mm-hmm. is that we aren't making progress right now. So I can't look to politicians for hope. I can't look to people that are in business for hope, except for small examples. But it's like on the wide spectrum of things, there isn't a lot to be hopeful for unless we're organizing and making our voices heard. That's when I feel the most hopeful. When I'm at a climate strike and going in the streets, making uh, going out with a sign with my friends and saying what needs to be done. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just a different feeling for me. I most of the time just feel disappointment, honestly. Just disappointment mm-hmm. in like the people that we voted in because we we had trust in them. And it's like that's the exact opposite of hope disappointment it's like you let us all down what are you doing mm-hmm. so yeah. yeah i don't know no I, I hear you 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 mentioned about feeling motivated at strikes and and uh feeling hope and inspired there now you uh recently went to global citizen um a global citizen live event which was uh, a 24 hour global event uh, to defend the planet and um defeat poverty Six continents uh, had artists, celebrities, world leaders coming together. Um, did that give you hope? I mean, seeing some of the artists that attended, and you could mention some of the names of people you met, met but um, things like that, is, is that a good sign that we have these people with massive platforms um, now speaking up, now doing things that they need to be doing and um, getting attention? Does that help? Yes. Have, that is so such a big help. Like, Having a platform of like Sean Mendez and Camila Cabello, Billy Eilish, Lizzo, all talking about climate change from the stage of 60,000 mm-hmm. people in Central Park, mm-hmm. that makes such a huge difference because it's the convergence of activism and art, in this case, musical art, that yeah. has some of the most transformative change possible because people may not remember anything from Martin Luther King's speech except for I Have a Dream, mm-hmm. but everyone will remember like Sean Mendez's new song. Or Lizzo's new song. <laughs> no, no, the lyrics memorizing their heads, and I'll be with them for weeks on end. That is so powerful. The the I'm rem- like the convergence of like basically slipping in like when and, I, and Billy's Billy Ash's song talking about sea levels rising and fires yes. raging and all of that. That sticks in people's head even stronger than any post or tweet or meme we can make. So it's it's so it was so hopeful to to be there as well. It's always great to meet people that are willing to use their platform for good. So definitely good. it was a good And actually, feeling. did you hear that Pitbull, like last like three albums have been called, I don't know the specific names, but got, you know, climate change, global warming, think they, his album names are things related to climate change. Oh, did I didn't know, know that. that. Yeah, I'll have I to, know. you'll have to look it up okay. after. But apparently he's been, the last three albums he's done, he's done that because then people are like, huh, why is he called it climate change? That's probably not the name, but um, I thought that was really cool that he um, had used, yeah, not only his music, but also an incredibly important piece of his music coming out, which is the name of the album. So uh, I wish I had knew that off the top of my head, but I don't, but I remember hearing about it. Um, One thing I would like to bring up, I did see that you were interviewed by former Vice President Al Gore at the Atlanta Climate Reality Leadership Training um, in March 2019. Now I did the um, uh, Climate Reality Leadership Training this, this year, and I found it just such a great experience to help me learn and grow and understand things and have understand that that intersectionality piece. So it is a free event of a free training, I suppose. So, um, as someone who has spoken at that, that's something I feel many listeners could do. It gives up, requires giving up a little bit of your time, but, um, it will really give you the tools and understanding to take action. So as someone who has spoken at that event, would you, is there anything else you would like to add to that too? Yeah. Maybe that's a simple thing people could do. Yeah. I think that climate reality leadership training is like such a transformative event because there's so many things that you learn from there about like how pressing climate change is and Mm -hmm. you get that initial doom and gloom, but then by the end of it, you feel that hope Mm -hmm. and you feel that sense of we can do this because all the technology is here. You learn that all the, the 
new inventions that ha- need to be made have been made and are ready to yes. be deployed at scale. It's just just waiting on policy, just waiting on politicians to do it. Mm-hmm. And that gives you a sense of opp- like a sense of like opportunity. It's like we're here. We're nearly there. We're at the finish line. But we're refusing to cross it. <laughs> that would yeah. be much that's much better than house having actually to run the race. But we've already run that race. Every solution's yeah. here. And I think that's what's so great about climate reality is that they dive yeah. into those details and teach you about that. Um for me in my example, um I went there in twenty nineteen and that was when I started like climate striking as well. I think it was uh, about a, two months into climate striking. Um mm-hmm. and I was there um with um by, um Representative John Lewis's team and with my high school. Um and everyone was there just felt that energy and you feel that, that just camaraderie as well, because like there's so many different sp- types of people that are speaking there and you learn about like how much the climate crisis is not just a, a crisis, but it's also a, a set of solutions that can be implemented that can better everyone's yes. lives. Whether you're in yes. Europe or whether you're in Africa or whether you're in South America, North America, you can see that like, this is such a great opportunity for us to make transformative change. And so if anyone has the time to do it, just do it. Like, it, and there's like so many digital versions you can attend to. Yeah, it's and true, yeah. If you're really passionate about this, that's like the easiest way you can do it. The two easiest yes. ways you can get in this movement, if you're feeling that despair of not being in it, is attending a climate reality training and attending a climate climate strike. So, so true. Yeah. Thank you. And then I just want to say with the climate reality, they also have chapters then within cities so you can continue working in your area, which has been really cool. Um, and so uh, one more thing I was going to ask you about that. Um, oh, so you said about the solutions that also gives you then it gives you the education to when you talk to people who have been told, oh, the batteries aren't there or the, oh, that we don't have the answer to this or the scientists need to figure this out where you could be like, well, actually they already have, like you said, it's sitting here waiting. So that continues. What they're talking about with batteries is that it's not as efficient, but it's already, the technology is here. They're saying, oh, they want to improve it even more. That's not an excuse. You're just saying you want to make an iPhone even more like powerful before they even release the first one. Like (laughs) that doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Yeah. 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 But it gives you the education piece to have those conversations with people that can make change and, and, and talking about it is one of the biggest things we can do. And thank you for the suggestions of the two things there. Now, finally, I want to talk to you. You're at the executive director of 1 million of us, an international youth advocacy and voting rights organization you founded in 2019. Tell us a little bit about what that is and how people can support you there. Absolutely. Um, so when about a month into my internship with Representative John Lewis, I was re- basically talking with my fellow interns there and having really in-depth conversations. Um, and at that time, I just understood climate change as CO2 emissions. We have to get it out of the air. And that's the only solution. And just slapping a solar panel on a house is going to solve everything. And <laughs> through the conversations I had through at the, at, um, at, in Congress and through that internship, we had other conversations of like an intern next to me was a, a women's rights advocate. And the one sitting to the right of me was like a criminal justice a- advocate. And we had so many different conversations about how the climate crisis isn't in a silo and that we're all fighting for the same justice. There's so many intersections between gun violence and, um, and sexual abuse. And there's so much um, intersection between climate change and political instability that it's like, why don't we all join together? And that was the mm-hmm. impetus to why I founded One Million of Us is to have an organization that brought together all justice movements under the umbrella of voting so that whenever we organize a strike or a protest or civil disobedience, that immediately transitions into voting. And the, the slogan was, um, take it to the streets, take it to the polls. And today we strike, tomorrow we vote. And the goal was to reach 1 million young people. And by the time November rolled around, we had 1.2 million young people that were registered to vote, getting out into the streets, and basically the thing that we did to make it fun so it wasn't just so heavy all the time was that we did a campaign called Prom at the Polls. Because of, because of the pandemic, our generation didn't really have a, a prom or a summer vacation or spring break. So we <laughs> said, why don't we bring really. back our... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, it was really like sad. So I was like, why don't we bring that happiness back by creating prom and making it not just celebrating you graduating high school, but graduating into adulthood by being an active mm-hmm. citizen which means voting. So on voting okay. day, we have people dress up in their prom dresses and prom suits that they never got to wear 
to wear that to the polls. So that was one of the biggest ways that we got young people to get involved. So and that's that was one million of us. It's awesome. Thank you. And and thanks for all your work there. So can people go to the website and donate or support? What is there anything they can do there? Yes. Um, one million of us is ramping up for the 2022 United States elections. And we're also working in the UK and expanding out to Europe this this um, this is next year. So awesome. if you're able to donate and able to contribute, we have a, a GoFundMe that goes straight into organizing. Like none of us take any and of that money as like salaries. It all goes into getting people registered to vote, organizing events in communities and getting young people from the classroom to the voting booth. So, yeah. Yes, thank you. All right, well, I put lots of links in the show notes there. Now, final thing I want to ask you, um, serving on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council within the Biden admin- administration, you've talked a lot about uh, about youth and how you, I've seen you say that you want to show um, a strong un- united political force um, as as the youth. But do you feel, have you always been taken seriously within that role by um, older members of the um, team? Or has that been something over time you've had to work to get people to to listen to you and pay attention? Yeah, but I think that's n- never been new to me. Like every time I've been in a space, I've oftentimes been the youngest person. And it was just the same thing. Like being the only Gen Z member in the entire administration has a kind of weight to it. And also they either underestimate you to a degree that they don't give you any duties or once you show yourself they're like oh okay now we can invite you back and i think that was the first meeting it was like everyone was there for the first like couple seconds they were like oh you're too young to be here but i basically introduced myself and told them you knocked them my out experience top. yeah and i said like i do deserve to be here like i've done research i've been at harvard i've done all the things that make the titles that make me feel legitimate and make them make me seem legitimate to other people and i think that's what legitimized it. I think now going into it, I'm now the co-chair of this committee and leading it the way because being a Gen Z, you're you're representing a future and you're embodying that future. And you're able to see being that we don't have jobs and we don't have that that money sphere that basically clouds you, we are able to see it in its purest form of just yeah. justice and equity. And that is so valuable in administrations like this that you aren't just in it for the money. And I think that's what's so crucial about being in the Biden administration is that we're able to have deep conversations about what actually has to happen. And in our council meetings, we don't just say we need change because everyone knows we need change. We actually sit in the room for five hours, sometimes more, and we go through community by community and say what is needed from a workforce development perspective, from an equitable, um, sustainable housing perspective, to a just transition perspective, to ending subsidies for the fossil fuel industry perspective, to stopping pipelines perspective like so many Mm -hmm. um nuances and perspectives are at the table now we're able to come down and sit and say this is what's needed this is the money that's needed and now let's go do it like for example we had now had 274 billion dollars from this council to now um help bolster the um electrical vehicles market and Mm -hmm. over the next um three to six months we're going to see that we have um clean water um infrastructure built and across communities um, key provisions that respects indigenous rights that will be implemented. And I think that just comes from the nature of this council. So it's great to be a part of it. It's such an honor to be a part of the Biden administration. And I am very grateful to be here. And I never expected to be here in like this early. So it's, so I'm really eternally grateful for everyone who believed in me. So. Yeah. Thank you. And then final thing related to that how do you not get disheartened when, you know, he cannot pass through everything or things may get through him and then they get blocked um, at the the House or the Senate? How do you not let that, like, affect you, like, your your health? Hmm, I think that is, we're in a special case right now in the United States where Democrats have the House, the Senate, and the White House, yet they still aren't passing bills. <laughs> so I don't mm-hmm. think it is an issue of, like, waiting for bills to happen or like they don't want to do it or we're fighting Republicans because Republicans don't have power in this, in this time period of 2021 and 2022 because we voted them out. So I think that whatever bill is not passing right now, we have to look to Senator Joe Manchin and the people that are corporate that are bought and paid for that are holding change back because a lot of times people say like, Oh, blue and red, like there's only two Mm -hmm, parties, mm -hmm. but people don't realize the fossil fuel industry gives money to both sides. So I think that is what has to change is that 
that perspective. But I never get disheartened or down when something doesn't happen. I just keep pushing forward because okay. people sent me here to, to fight for them. So I'm going to keep on fighting no matter what. Yeah. Well, I hope you do have some way of self-care and looking after yourself and do have some downtime somehow because uh, we need we need your bright light in this world. So um, look after it. Um, oh, yeah. My cat does that. I have a cat and she literally cat, like good. just lays on my laptop and says, just stop working. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> I She's like, that. goes to my laptop and is like, get up. <laughs> She's your self-care so. cat. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll take that. Course. Well, Jerome, thank you so much for talking with me today. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I am so inspired by you and um, appreciate all that you are doing. Um, I want to say keep up the good work, but also please take care of you. Um, we we appreciate all that you're doing. Thank you. I'm inspired by you, but it's by having this podcast and spreading the message. Like This is so great to have these communities and have these spaces to talk about these things. So I'm grateful to be here and excited to hear more conversations that you have on this podcast. Before we end this episode, I just want to take a moment to shout out my podcast editor, Jeremy Nessel, who has done such a wonderful job of looking after my podcast, taking out all the mis mishaps in the episodes, while still keeping in the, the vulnerability and the realness and the rawness of the conversation. This is not one of those podcasts where I take out the ums and the ers and the the sometimes the delay in in words because i think it's very important to keep that authenticity we're surrounded by perfected and manicured everything and i think it's really important that running for real stays that way so thank you to jeremy for your work i also want to thank maria vargas and amber moore who are also part of my team they've been a big part of this community and me being able to build this brand so just want to give them a shout out too all right let's get right back to the end of this episode I admire Jerome so much. I really appreciated that conversation. Uh, we have stayed in touch since. So I'm really thankful for all that he is doing to change things. And I personally feel a lot more optimistic uh, knowing that there are people like him really putting thought into this um, and that are on the advisory council under the Biden administration making those changes happen. Uh, yeah, I'm just thankful for that conversation. Thank you for tuning in. I know it's very easy to feel climate despondency and just want to shut it out. So the fact that you listened, I appreciate you doing so. That shows that you you care and you want to help and do what you can, do your part. So I hope you were able to take some of Jerome's advice today. I want to thank our sponsors for today. Inside Tracker, you can get 25% off your uh, any order that you make off Inside Tracker by going to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina. Keep an eye on your blood work. This is one of the number one thing way people can uh, keep on top of how their health is doing from the inside. It is also more and more widely recommended as the way to keep an eye on your health without looking at numbers on the scale. That's a great way to see what's going on. Uh, I want to thank Beam for sponsoring this episode. You can get 15% off by going to beamtlc.com and using code TINA. That will get you 15% off your order. And finally, thank you to Tracksmith for supporting me, but also for supporting Runners for Public Lands. Now, Tracksmith is going to give 5% of all sales made by Running for Your Listeners to support Runners for Public Lands, which is a 501c3 nonprofit environmental organization dedicated to environmental justice, advocacy, and conservation. So if you use code TINA15, you'll participate in this, give your 5% of your order to Runners for Public Lands, and you will receive free shipping on your entire order. Now you can go find this by going to tracksmith.com forward slash collections forward slash running dash for dash real. I will also make sure that there is a link um, in the show notes. so You can go get it easily there. Thank you so much to our sponsors for sponsoring this episode. Thank you to Jerome for coming on and talking to me today and to you, the listener. I appreciate all that you are doing. See you next week.